Shall we share a word of prayer? Father, your word says that unto you shall the gathering of your people be. This morning we have gathered in your presence. I pray that you will do your work in us. I pray that you will fulfill your purpose for our gathering this afternoon. I pray in the name of Jesus that none of us will leave this place the same. I pray for the right soil in our hearts that your word may fall on good soil, O oh God, and yield a hundredfold to the praise of your name. Let your word transform us. Let your word transform our lives. Let your word transform our marriages. Let your word transform our homes. Let the word transform your call and your purpose on our lives. Let us never be the same because of the presence of your spirit and of your word. The words that I speak this morning to your people, may they be spirit and may they be life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Please take your seats. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We thank God for successfully bringing us to the last day of our convention. God has been good and he has been faithful. Amen. Amen. I want to thank also my husband, the bishop, for releasing me to be here. And I want to thank him for taking care of the children whilst I am here. He has not gone on Healing Jesus Crusade. He's working in Accra. But he's taking very good care of the children. And I won't be surprised if they are not really missing me. But that's no problem at all. I spoke to my son who is in boarding school in Akosombo. He told me daddy came to visit him yesterday Amen. with my two daughters. And I said, but you are finishing your last paper on Wednesday. How come daddy came to visit you on Saturday? So daddy said it was my last visiting day and he wanted to make it memorable for me. So that was touching. Amen. So those of you who are not bishops yet and you don't have time for your children or for anything, may the Lord deliver you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know that the, the times for your children will not last forever. Before you bat an eyelid, they will be leaving home. And so please, the brothers, be involved in the lives of your children. It is a blessing for you. It is not just a duty. It will make your life more exciting. So God bless you. And sometimes take some of the pressure of the women so that they can love you and be a blessing to you in the bedroom. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Amen. And I know that we have wonderful sons in the house who support us, who love us, and who are dedicated to us. Amen. Shall we give it up for the sons? Amen. Thank you for your support and your love for urging us on as daughters and for not being intimidated and putting us down, but for allowing us to express our God-given gift. God bless you. And I want to thank God for your Reverend Jimmy Blavo, your GO on this side of Europe, Pastor Jimmy and Anita. God bless you for your faithfulness. God bless you for the kind of heart you have. God bless you for the beast you have fought in Ephesus. And for the weather, the storming, the storms that have come that you have weathered by the grace of God. And for all the pastors, Pastor Mary in Lausanne, she has behaved as if Lausanne is the only church represented here. <laughs> but you are forgiven even before you sin. We thank all the pastors from Geneva to Bern to Versoa to Elecon, everywhere you are shining the light of the gospel. You are giving hope to God's people and you can never give to God and lose. So God bless you greatly. I want to encourage you to be steadfast. You see, Every relationship worth its salt will be tested at some point in time. 
And you will know the value or the validity of the relationship after it stands after the storm. But if it's still standing after the storm or when it's still standing after the storm, then you know that it's a relationship of value more than 18 karat gold. But when, if the storm comes or there's a little shaking, then you say, eh, me, I'm passing here, me, I'm passing, then your faithfulness is in question. But may the Lord give you tenacity and endurance. He didn't just call us. He said that he that endureth to the end shall be blessed. So may we endure to the end in Switzerland. And I know that the Lord will strengthen your hands. And all of you who have come from different places to make this convention what it has been, God bless you. Those of you who sang, those of you who prayed, those of you who cooked, those of you who are not even seen, your Father who sees in secret will honor you openly. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And those of you who have also given to the children in the primary school, those of you who have given on Mother's Day, God bless you. Amen. And God answer your secret prayers. Amen. You know, there are some prayers you don't want anybody to know about. And there are some prayers that come out, they are no words, like Hannah. The Bible says her lips moved, but there were no words because of the intensity of the prayer. But your father, who also hears, will hear you in that secret place. So may the Lord give you that child that you desire. May that womb be touched from henceforth by the power of the Holy Spirit. May whatever your heart is troubled about be count. And may you know the faithfulness of God. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to especially thank our sisters from the UK also for coming because we just finished the UK daughter and it was quite a marathon but thank you for coming to support God's work here and it's amazing to see that we are all one family and when you come you don't need a lot of posing and protocol before you can flow because the spirit is the same God bless you and take you safely to the UK. Amen. And because of you, may many be turned Amen. to righteousness. Amen. Next year by now, may God have moved you to another level in him. Amen. And that goes for every daughter here. Amen. I want to see more lady pastors the next time I come. Amen. 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 And I know that God will do it <laughs> in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning, I will be brief because it's the last day. I want to speak to you about types of hearers. Types of hearers. Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33. Types of hearers. You know Ezekiel. He's a powerful man of God, but it's not a name I'm particularly fond of. <laughs> Ezekiel 33. Are we there? We are reading from verse 30. Ezekiel 33, verse 30. But as for you, son of man, your fellow citizens who talk about you by the walls and in the doorways of the houses, speak to one another, each to his brother, saying, Come now and hear what the message is which comes forth from the Lord. And they come to you as people come, and sit before you as my people, and hear your words, but they do not do them, for they do the lustful desires expressed by their mouth, and their heart goes after their gain. And behold, you are to them like a sensual song by one who has a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument, 
for they hear your words, but they do not practice them. Amen. Amen. The first kind of hearer I want you to know about is the sentimental hearer. This sentimental or sensual hearer hears by the senses and is excited by what he or she hears. If you read from verse 30, it says that they talk about you by the walls and in the doorways and to one another that come, let us go and hear what the message of the Lord is. So they are talking about the vessel that God is using, that's Ezekiel. And the Bible says that they talk about you in the doorways and by the walls and to each other. They are excited about God using you as a vessel. They are excited about, doctor, you can make it. They are excited about prophetic conventions and conferences. They are excited about homecoming. They are excited about every gathering. And they talk about it by the doorways and by the wall to each other. Come, let us go and hear what the Lord has to say. And they come to you as people come, just like a concert or a theater. They come and they sit before you, the Bible says. But they do, the, but they do not do, they, say they hear your words, but they do not do them. For they do the lustful desires expressed by their mouth and their heart goes after their gain. So they even hear you, they sit down, they organize, they hear what you have to say, but they don't do what you are saying because their lustful desires is what is leading them, not what they hear. And then God comes to verse 30 and says, but as for you, son of man, you are to them like a sensual song. You know, like uh, when you go to a concert, Michael Jackson or Lionel Richie, you know, only you. The only one who stole my heart away. Ah, the reaction has come. Yay! And the world applauds when Lano reaches six. Maybe Lano reaches my time. I don't know who is now here. You know, but all the Beyonce and all the great singers, when they sing, Celine Dion and they rap, and people stand up. Yeah, we are all so excited. Oh, the whole atmosphere is charged. It's not the anointing. It's sensual excitement. And the church of God has become like a place that stars come to. And the star is the preacher who stands on the stage and preaches and ministers. And we all stand and we say, yeah, preach it. It's the word. Go for it. But we are not changed. The preacher is to you like a sensual song. The song that appeals to your senses. She's fresh. She's fresh. <laughs> then you are thinking about so many things. Killing me softly. Why would you go towards love that kills you but softly? It kills you anyway. Amen. You are to them like a sensual song. A song that excites our senses. And we know all the great men of God on TV. And we know all the great women on TV. But we are not changed. Because it's like a sensual song. After the concert, you are happy. Your senses are satisfied. But that's it. There's no ministration. There's no spirit behind it. There's no commitment to the word. And that is how the church of God has become. Sensual hearers. Hallelujah. You wonder, in this season that churches have multiplied, the word of God has multiplied, the book of Acts said, so mightily grew the word of God and multiplied. But when it did that, lives were touched. People were saved. People were changed. Magicians brought their things and bent them because the word of God had come. But now when the word of God comes, we go deeper into our sensual things. It is like a song, a nice song you heard. So after church, it's pleasurable, but it doesn't evoke any obedience from us. And this is not new. It's from the time of Ezekiel. The church of God has become like a social club. We are all excited, but we are not committed to anything. 
And that is why we can't see the power of God. That's why we can't see the hand of God. That's why we can't know God the way we should know him. Because after the sensual song, hey, Michael Jackson can sing. He's good. And all that. Did you see his dance and his things that he does? And, uh, have you heard? They are topping the charts. And, and, and that's it. It's just supposed to be something for pleasure. Not something that changes us. But God sent forth his word to heal us. Yeah. And when God sends forth his word, it's just like the medicine that the doctor gives. He's written on it two times a day, antibiotics. Don't forget to take it. Take this milligram. Everything. You've gone to see the doctor. He's written everything. You look at it. He said, the packaging is nice. Oh, it's exciting. Oh, look at the attractive colors. Oh, this medicine. I know if I take it, something great will happen. But you never take it. You will never get well. Amen. Amen. He says three times a day. He says, for me, I'll take it once. I'll take it once in a while. I'll take it when I feel like it. It will not benefit you. The same it is with God's word. And I pray that God will bring us to that place where we will not be only sensual hearers, but we will move from our sensuality. It's good to be excited about God's word. You see, when uh, uh, Manchester United and Chelsea were playing in Russia, they were saying on television that 20,000 fans are going from the UK alone to Moscow. And that each person is costing each person 2,000 pounds. And I said, God, because this one is for pleasure, and so nobody is saying that, hey, football, how can you use money like that for football? I mean, I mean, what do people think about? So it's their pleasure. It's their hobby. Let them go for it. But if it's the church, there will be problems. Why are 20,000 going to Moscow? What's happening in Moscow? Why should, I, why should I pay so much money for a convention? After all, are they not on TV? Are Manchester and Chelsea not on TV? But you want to be there live for a reason. And where your passion is, that is what will drive you. Hallelujah. There's nothing wrong with sports. There's nothing wrong. But where your drive, your zeal, where you see that your energy has come, that is where your treasure is. And the world will never criticize them. The football, Africa, people are perishing. Look at what the, but when is the church? Say, so, huh? Why are they preaching? They should rather go and do ball holes. Why, why are they playing football? They should go and do ball holes. There are a lot of needs in the world. And needs should come before pleasure. I mean, if you want to make such light arguments, we can all bring those arguments. But when I looked at it, I said, that is why the church is a spiritual thing. The church is under a lot of attack because it's a spiritual thing. When the people are paying at the stadium, they don't say that eh, small football match that we are coming to watch. Look at how Manchester, the tickets have gone up. Cheats. This, it doesn't occur to you. You feel that they deserve it. But when is the church of God? And even to help orphans and helpless people. People have to talk a lot and explain a lot. And don't. May the Lord change our hearts. Amen. So that our passion will be in the right place. Amen. And I feel that it's right to pray to God that, Lord, I see that when it comes to things of you, I don't have zeal. But when it comes to things of you, you see, the body is made that way. How come the body always craves for things that are not good for it? Coke fries, hamburgers, things that, but the things that the body must like, the body doesn't like it. It's not programmed that way. Vegetables, fruits, water. You don't like it. You like the colored things because the body is programmed. It is Satan's meal. The Bible says that God cares Satan and says that you will eat of the, you go on your belly and the dust of the field shall be your food. And the Bible says when God was making us, he put dust and breathed into our nostrils. So we are Satan's staple diet. And he constantly feeds on the body that is made of clay. And so the body craves things that will not help it. Always. Things that will kill the body. That's what the body wants fully. And that's why Christ came. So that through him we will have domination over the body. Because the body is something. It's something. And God will help us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Come with me to 1 Samuel. And I'm not going to be long. Let's look at 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. Sentimental hearers. The Lord is going to deliver us. Are we at 1 Samuel? 
15. Reading from verse 1 is a popular story. This one is the stubborn hearer. The stubborn hearer. Then Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel. How he set himself against him on the way while he was coming up from Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has. And do not spare him, but put to death what? Both man and woman, child, infant, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. Then Saul summoned the people and numbered them in Telim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the valley. So, so verse 7, so Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as you go to Shu, which is east of Egypt. Verse 8, and he captured Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of a sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were not willing to destroy them utterly. But everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I regret, may the Lord not regret having made you something. I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not carried out my commandments. And Samuel was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night, but Saul was asleep. Verse 16. <laughs> then Samuel said to Saul, wait and, and let me tell you what the Lord has said to me last night. And he said to him, speak. And Samuel said, is it not true? Though you were little in your own eyes, you were made the head of the tribes of Israel. And the Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go and utterly destroy the Amalekites and fight against them until they are exterminated. Verse 19. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but rushed upon the spoil and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord? Then Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord and went on the mission on which the Lord sent me and have brought back Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took some of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the choices of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And then, verse 24, Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, have indeed transgressed the command of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and listened to their voice. Amen. Amen. I was saying that this is a popular story. Now God said to Samuel, go and tell Saul and give him these instructions. I have something to settle with the Amalekites. They didn't treat my people well when they were on their journey. And I want Saul to go and utterly destroy them. He shouldn't preserve anything. He shouldn't take anything. He should kill all of them. Beloved, Saul raised an army of 200,000. And then he raised men of Judah, 10,000. And he took the journey and went as God had said. And he fought as God had commanded him. But he took some of the spoil. The Bible says he took the best of the sheep, of the oxen. God said, destroy everything, every person. And he said, oh, ask for the king. <laughs> it's a delicate issue. And, and sometimes, God, when you give instructions, because you are not here on earth with us, you don't know some of the difficulties. So I would like to help you. You know, I got the king, I'll preserve him. And then the best things like the sheep and the oxen and some of the fatlings, I, I, I'll just preserve it. So he kept it. And he didn't know that Samuel knew. But he knew that the people knew. And the Bible says that Samuel in the night, he was distressed. He couldn't sleep. Sometimes when you are distressed in the night, God is calling you to pray. 
He wants to reveal something to you. Amen. Amen. And so when he woke, when he was distressed, God came to him and said, look, I sent Saul and he has changed. He has not obeyed me. He has brought the fatlings and all that. He has even brought Agag back to Israel. And Samuel went to ask Saul. We didn't have time to read it. But Saul was arguing with Samuel in the beginning. I, I have obeyed God. That's what he said. And that's what many of us are saying. Because we have selective hearers and stubborn hearers. Amen. Amen. Stubborn and selective hearers obey to a point. Obey in certain areas. Obey to a certain extent, but not to every extent. Amen. Amen. So, yes, we saw you going to battle. We saw you going to war. We saw you building up a strong army of 210,000. And we being men, when we saw you, we said you are doing very well. What God asked you to do, you have done. God asked you to fight. You have gone. You have fought. You have conquered. You are great. But in the sight of God, he knows that you hate some sheep, the best sheep. You hate some oxen. And some other man of God is commending you that you have obeyed. So God reveals to him in a vision that you actually have not obeyed. And all things are naked unto him with whom we have to do. And when someone is trying to get your attention that, look, this is what you have done. Instead of humbling yourself and listening to God and what he's saying and repenting immediately, you have set up a debating society, a committee for pros and cons to see what you are saying. And you... Someone said, is it not true that when you were little in your own eyes, you were made the head, and the Lord sent you. Why did you not obey? Then Saul said to someone, I did obey the voice of the Lord and went out on the mission on which the Lord sent. And he didn't say, but, and have brought back Agag. I mean, I brought Agag and things, but it's not so crucial to obeying God. Amen. Amen. I've done the main thing, especially the one that can be seen by man's eyes. But the ones in my hidden closet, in my heart, in places that are not known, in places that only God has to reveal, I don't work on that area. I work only on the area that's visible. On the area that looks like a big campaign. That's the area I work on. But on the small hidden areas where no man's eyes can see, or where it's only between me and the people, I continue to do what I like. He said, and even when I disobeyed and I brought Agag and I'm coming to sacrifice it to him. You see, sometimes God has not given you an instruction. He said, I think you need this. Sometimes I work with people. I said, do this. <laughs> write a letter and write these four points. I cannot explain to you why you shouldn't write six. But I can just give you an instruction with the little time I have that write these four points. And then when I come, you say that, I thought that they should also know this, so I've added six points. You have created more work for me, more confusion, and because you want me to explain everything in detail. Okay, the reason why I'm telling you to write four is because you see the other two. This, meanwhile, I have to go for other meetings. So I said, write these four. Just obey it. Why has it become a problem? I said, just go and don't bring anything. You said, I brought a gag and I brought, because you see, Lord, I think you need a sacrifice. You need my offering more than my obedience. So I brought all these things. And Samuel said, because you have rejected God, God also has rejected you. Amen. Amen. You see, when you are doing things with people, think about yourself. Because Saul did this with people. He said, it's the people. They said I should take it. They... But the people did not receive a word of punishment from the Lord. And they were not told that they have been rejected. But you, Saul, you are told that you have been rejected. Miriam and, Miriam and Aaron, they both spoke against Moses. But it's Miriam who got the leprosy and not Aaron. So some of the things, you don't have to add yourself, we are all disobeying. We are all moving. We are all doing. Hey, life is an individual thing. Especially our work with God. Amen. When Adam and Eve fell, they didn't say, Mr. and Mrs. Adam, come. Now we are going to share a couple sins. The punishments were different. So Adam, by the sweat of your faith, as for you, Eve, your desire shall be unto your husband. It's not an easy case. Oh. <laughs> and he will rule over you. That's why women have that desire no matter what. 
They are beating them. They say, this one is not good, but another one will be better. <laughs> they are killing them. They say, I have to try and let it work. Yes. Amen. Yes. No matter what that desire is not easy to overcome. Your desire shall be unto your husband. It's like, this is your desire. And when you got married, you knelt down and said, here, this is desire. Have it. So your desire to do masters, your desire to build a house, all those things are affected by him. Because your desire is, and he will, he's ruling over you fully. And you are always looking for somebody to rule over you. And you don't choose good rulers too. Tyrants, dictators, though. Those are the rulers we fall in love with. Your desire shall be unto your husband. And he shall rule over you. And then it says, in sorrow shall thou give birth. And it's amazing. We want the curse to happen to us. If the curse doesn't happen to you, it means you are not blessed. The curse of childbearing and conception, it's a curse. But we want the curse at all costs. Because of the curse, some of us, we don't sleep. Because that curse in the garden must come to pass. <laughs> it's a contradiction of life. Amen. And I believe also it's the mercy of God. Because when God curses you, it is even like a blessing. I see that that's, that's God's nature. When even he curses you like work, you will, from the toil of your face, then he, he just gives you power to make world so that the curse will be a bit, you know, ameliorated. That's how God works. Amen. Amen. And someone says to him, to obey is better than to sacrifice. But why do you feel that? I want to obey about sacrifice because it's easier for you. Because there's an advantage in there sometimes. And you just, you, you want an advantage, but you want to spiritualize it. So even though I brought the best, and it's also to sacrifice some to you, Lord. So be grateful. I may not have done the right thing 100%, but the 10%, I share the guilt with you, Lord. Mercy. The Bible says that Samuel himself took an axe and fell on Agag to pieces. What you should have done with an army easily, you have brought complications by bringing him into Jerusalem. Now the high priest who should be offering sacrifices is killing your Agags for you. Because we are not listening to the word. We pastors are having to do things that we don't have to do. Because we are not obeying the word. So the Samuels are now killing the Agags before they have time to even continue with you in your work with God. Hallelujah. And in 2 Samuel 1.1, 1, 1, David goes to fight. And who does he go to fight? The Amalekites, the same people. You see, our disobedience is so far-reaching, but we don't see it and we don't know it. Later, when David runs away from Saul and all that, he goes to fight the Amalekites. And when he comes back, the city is burnt, his children are taken, his wife is taken, and everything in the city is taken. The enemy obeys God more than us. Everything is taken, nothing is left. That was God's command to uh, uh, Saul about the Amalekites. He didn't do it. But the Amalekites came to Ziklag and cleared everything out. The Bible says when David and his men got there, my goodness, they lifted up their voices, men, soldiers, and wept until there was nothing left in them. There was no strength left in them. And then the people said, even this David, if we had been here, when the Amalekites came, we could have gathered out. So let's stone him to death. Just one person's disobedience has spilt and had ripple effects on family life, children, whole villages are burnt, people are carried away, people are captured just because of your one disobedience. And because we look down on the effects of our disobedience, oh, it's just a, it's just a casual sin. Somebody can say, Lady Pastor, I'm a little pregnant. I said, you can never be a little pregnant. <laughs> if you are pregnant, you are pregnant, not a little. What is a little pregnant? Pregnancy is pregnancy. Amen. And many of us, it just took one act of disobedience. And that is why we have come to a place where we wouldn't like to be. Just one act of disobedience. Later, it has a ripple effect. Villages are burnt. Children are taking mercy. 
children are taken, everything is carried away. Now David and his men have to go and chase them and then bring them back. Your disobedience has caused too much complication in the house of God. Hallelujah. Amen. When Eve took the apple, look at the effect. An apple in a woman's hands, cancer, betrayal, broken relationships, heartache, rejection, war, destruction, Kosovo, Bosnia, all of it, one apple. But we always see just the moment. Oh, it's just, <laughs> it's just an apple. It's just an apple. Hitler has come about. Osama bin Laden. <laughs> so many things have happened. Because of disobedience. And you will never know the effect of your disobedience until you disobey. And then it manifests. And I realize that even the effects are sometimes beyond your lifetime. Like Eve, 2,000 years and more down the line, we are still having serpentine bites and struggles with the devil. Because the Bible says there will be enmity between the serpent and the woman. And the woman's seed and the serpent's seed. And the battle continues. So then we have to now introduce Jesus, prophet, one woman. Ah, Delilah. I always tell you. You see, we don't have bazookas, AK-47, but our weapons are powerful. A pair of soft laps alone. We don't need uh, armored cars and... These type of, no, we don't need them. A lap. The Philistine Lord, too. The Lords, they came to see Delilah. And said, so you know, we've been trying this Samson. He's been carrying the gates of Gaza, killing our army single-handedly. We can't control him. But we think that you can. De Delilah said, I don't even have to go to a shop to buy instruments or even knives to do anything. I have just my laps. Just how God made me. I can use it. I'm a I'm, I, I, me, as I'm standing here, I'm a weapon. And when Samson comes, she lies to Samson three times. I don't know how men think. <laughs> three times, the Samson. What will happen if the Samson said that? Oh, if you tie me with ropes, then she ties you with ropes. Does it not occur to you that you are in dangerous territory? Oh, man. And then you, did she say, Samson, the Philistine lords are coming. Then you flex, you flex your muscles and then you break. Lesson one. Lesson two, you say, well, if they braid my hair, then she braids your hair. Then she says, Samson, the Philistine Lord, is it a riddle? I mean, it should occur to you that what type of woman is this? <laughs> but because of the lapse, when the man puts his hand on the lap, all sense departs. <laughs> Amen, ladies. Just a lap. You see, men will go and buy things. Oh, okay, uh, if I want to uh, uh, kill this person, I need a spear, I need a gun, I need an AK-47, these type of things. We are structure alone. I'll just come in to stand there. It's enough. Amen. Amen. Those flimsy clothes, that don't cost you anything. When you wear it. The Bible says mighty men have been slain through that. Mighty men. Just a blouse. So sometimes they say that, you know, men are powerful. I wonder. I wonder. Because even pregnancy, it lies in the power of a woman, not a man. Amen. The man said, no, no, no. I want only two children. The woman was okay. We are moving. Then in two years, I, said, I don't feel well. He said, what happened? He said, I don't know what happened. I just, I feel like, three. I just don't know what, I don't feel well. The husband said, huh? But I thought we said two, said, me too, I thought so. But. The power is in her hands. Amen. And because of that, our obedience is far-reaching. Our disobedience is also far-reaching. Just because 
we are people of influence. That's how God has made us. And even I am a woman, I can't always decipher other women. It's not easy. How much more a man? Because we won't talk, oh. But you say something, hmm. Just, it's not even a word. Hmm, it's more than a message. <laughs> it's more than a message. Hmm. Or if something is up, there, the way we will walk by the thing. You know, we won't say that, oh, you say, well, um, the man will be talking a lot. So what do you think? This, that, that, that. Oh, this person, I will sort her out. How will you sort her out? The man is sitting there. Then the woman comes to pass. <laughs> the man thinks that she's just being fashionable. But the other woman knows that war, war, words of war. War has been declared. The Amalekites did not die because of selective disobedience and because of stubborn disobedience. We are not quick to say God is true when we hear a word. We are not quick to say I'm in the preaching. We are not quick to say, I repent. You know, we make an emotional decision. Oh, this thing is not good. You know, pride of life. Oh, it's true. I'll try not to be proud again, but a real commitment to allow the Holy Ghost to change us is not there. It's not there. And that's why sometimes some husbands get very angry. So, Lady Pastor, she's always coming to church, singing, but I don't see it in the home. Total disobedience and rebellion in the home. And then when she comes, the pastor says, this is my best lady pastor. Always caring for the sheep. Always doing what she should do. Oh, she's really anointed. The husband sits in the congregation, very angry. <laughs> anointed from where she has stabbed me for four days and I'm sitting here. <laughs> is that anointing? <laughs> Amen. We want to talk about... <laughs> Show the hearers. We want to talk about the good hearer. Luke chapter 8, and we are ending with that. Luke chapter 8. May God not struggle to show you something he wants to change about you. It's God, so he's doing it in love. It's not because he wants to put you down. It's not because he wants to destroy you, but because he wants to make us better people. Amen. You see, David had the same problem. When Saul came to him and said, hey, when Nathan the prophet came to him and said, you have sinned. You have done this, this, David. I mean, he didn't get it. The Nathan put it in story form. He said a man had just one lamb, which was his everything. It was even like a daughter to him. And then one other man who had a lot of sheep, a big flock, came and took the one sheep. The David said, oh, that man has to die immediately. And he has to pay four times what he took. And Nathan said, that man is you. Because when it's us, we look through things with rose-colored glasses. We don't want to say that this ugliness is in me. This envy and jealousy is in me. This meanness is in me. So God can reach us. But what is somebody else saying? But why is she like that? Is this a Christian? But you, your closet, when we open it, the things that are in it, we will not like to tell. But because it's somebody else, we are quick to pass judgment. And so God even has to reach us through parables. Because if he tells us directly like David, we will not accept. He has to use parables. And then when we are in the trap, then he says, it's you. You know? To get our attention. But as soon as David realized that, he repented immediately. Quick repentance, quick change brings the Holy Ghost on our side. And helps us to become what God wants us to be. Luke chapter 8. This is also a popular story about the sower who went to sow. Some fell on good ground, some fell on stone, some fell on a pathway, but we are looking at the one that fell on good soil. Luke chapter 8 verse 15. And the seed in the good soil these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with patience. Amen. 
There are certain qualities about the good seed or the good hearer. First of all, he hears the word. Number two, he hears the word in an honest heart or with an honest heart. And then number three, he hears the word with a good heart. Number four, he holds it fast. And number five, he bears fruit with patience. Amen. Now the Bible says, these are they who with a good heart, they hear the, God, the, the word, first of all. So the fact that you have come even to hear is a good step. The fact that you, you, you buy a tape to hear is a good step. The fact that the Bible can make you hear is a good step, but that's only step one. And when you are learning to walk, you don't just take a crawl and say, I'm okay. But you go on from stage to stage till you become a sure walker and an independent person who can walk on their own. So with an honest and a good heart, you need honesty to be a good hearer. And a good hearer is the one who does what the word of God says. And I realize that many Christians struggle with obedience because we are very, 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 very effort-oriented. You know? But since God taught me about grace, I've learned to walk, walk more with the grace of God than with my own effort. Because if you use your own effort, then you are just like any unbeliever out there who has made a New Year resolution. I won't do this again. I won't go there again. I won't do this. I, 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 I. But if you say that the power of God in me is strong enough to enable me to rise up and become what God wants me to be, you begin to depend more on the grace of God. And you depend more on the grace of God daily. The Bible says, give us this day our daily bread. It's a daily thing. You can't have grace for three years. It will run out. You need daily grace, bite-sized grace, to walk in little, little steps. But it's part of the journey. Right. And God will ensure that you get there. An honest heart says, I am this. This is me. You see, I always tell the story of when I was coming into full-time ministry. And I told God, you know, I've always known that you called me, I, although I didn't understand it. But I knew that I wanted to be a missionary from the age of nine. And that is what I want to do. That is my heart. But my problem is the people. Just like so. It's the people. And God said, really, what have the people done? I said, Lord, people talk about pastors. People are so mean. They think pastors want what they have. And sometimes rather, you even have what they don't have. You know, so God is not you. But if I say yes to full time ministry, when I wear my shoes, they'll say it's offering. When I wear my dress, they'll say it's offering. When I travel, they'll say it's offering. But Lord, I've been doing all these things without offering. And so, you know, it's not you. As for you, you are a good God. But the people are bad, Lord. <laughs> the people are bad, Lord. And I had this struggle. And I, I, I went into my closet time and time again. Then one day, God said to me, you are proud. Oh, 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 oh. You must be talking to the wrong person. <laughs> I mean, I have a very humble spirit, Lord. And even when I'm dealing with people, I don't think about who you are. Oh, God. I have a sweet spirit. I'm humble. You know it, Lord. How come you are bringing such bad suggestions? And the Lord said, it's pride. You are thinking that you are somebody. So nobody should say your oh, she's from the offering, that this is that. I mean, you are too big to be brought down. And the one I'm pointing out to you, you say it's the people. It's you. <laughs> and it's in your heart. But from the outward, people were applauding me when they see me in church. Say, oh, Sister Mommy, we hear you've come full time. God bless you. It's such a great move. You know, but God was looking at me and said that fried pride-filled full-timer. <laughs> Discontented full-timer walking about. But some people were saying, oh, it's the greatest thing you could do. Go for it. It's, oh, it's so good. You've now finally come. But God was seeing something else. And God said, you have to give up your Isaac. I said, which Isaac? I gave up my husband. Is that Isaac? He's not called Isaac, but... 
He was more than an Isaac to me. And I gave him up to do your work, to free him and all that. It's not always easy. So what else would you... And God said, your image, your reputation. You see, those are the times when my quiet time is this pride of life as well. And I come and say, then you think that was a powerful revelation. It was a work within. Amen. Amen. And I said, Lord, no, it doesn't matter. He said, do you know Jesus made himself of no reputation? I have it. On the second page of my book, I wrote, Full, feeling put down in the ministry. That's what I've written. Then I've written one. He made himself. God didn't make him. He made himself of no reputation. And made himself a man. And when he became man, they said all sorts of things. They even said, if you are the son of God, how come you are on the cross? Come down and walk here and let's see. But the Holy Spirit dealt with me and my pride. Which nobody can see. They are just like the cows and the sheep and the donkeys. All that Samuel knows is that I've obeyed. But Jehovah knows that it's selective and partial obedience. A good and an honest heart. And so I broke down and I wept so much. Lord, it's true. But the reality too is that it's hard for me. So Lord, I'm an educated woman. And not just educated, I have a postgraduate from London. Lord, do you know that? <laughs> God said, I know all that, but it seems you are very concerned about these things. Mm. But this is the altar. If you can put it here and make yourself of no reputation. Forget about what people say. Forget about the tongue. I mean, even if they say it's from the office, you say, my husband will remove his shoes from the church, in the church, and he'll be saying, you think it's from the offering? Yes, it is. And I'll, I'll just be dying. <laughs> I'll just be dying. And he'll hold his uh, tie and say that, ah, uh, my tie is offering it. My whole being is offering it. Just, Jesus. What is this? But I put it on the altar. I wept. You see, when you are relating something, it's like, you did it on Tuesday, then on Wednesday, you just put it on the altar, and then by Thursday, you were fine. But it's not like that. Even the chapters of the Bible, when he said, Abraham did this, and he took a journey. It's just one sentence. Oh, he went, and then he just got there. But it's a journey. I put it down. I didn't put it down with joy. I wept and I felt broken. Broken because even when I came for it, I went to do other maneuvers to meet some German man to give me a personal contract. And I came to my husband. I said, I'm rather a blessing to the church. The church doesn't pay me. I'm a blessing. And then God told me, even that is pride. It's not because you want to be the motive. It's not because you want to be a blessing to the church. You don't want to be on their payroll. Your name is there, Adelaide. You know, social security is tax. Ah, Me, pa. <laughs> but I put it on the altar, a good and an honest heart. And God was able to move me on from there. And now, it doesn't even matter. What who thinks, what who says, for all things are naked unto him with whom I have to do. Amen. Amen. Once I went to court with my mother-in-law because we had something to do with property. And when I went to court on that day, I decided to wear black and white so that I would be able to sit at the bar. So when I was going up the stairs with her, I met some of my mates, my juniors. Oh, great. At long last, you've come back. We are so excited to see you. Are you going to rob? Let's go. Let's go and rob together. They thought that I have a case and then I've come to join the lady again. And, the very, and then somebody said to me, when you took that decision, I was very worried. You know, these church, charismatic church, and how they talk at the, the revelation he has given us. So I didn't come back at all. I'm just coming to encourage somebody. I didn't come back. But at that time, all those things had died. So when I met them, it wasn't like, oh, yeah, let's all go and robe and wear our wigs and really feel that. No. Now my daughter, my little daughter Paula says to me, you say you are a lawyer, but I've never seen <laughs> What work do lawyers do? Where do they go? What do they do? I've never seen. But I took an honest heart. You see, don't call it other things. Call it lust. Call it greed. Call it envy. Call it jealousy. Call it what it is. Don't call it the people. Don't call it, so said, I obeyed, but it's the people. Don't, don't rely on circumstantial things. Let the Holy Spirit give you the name that it is. Call a spade a spade and not an agricultural instrument. Amen. Amen. 
If it's a demon, say it's a demon. Don't say it's a weakness. If it's a spirit of fear, call it the spirit of fear. Don't say it's insecurity and a bit of, you know. Those names don't make us see the thing as it is. If it is unbridled and uh, uncontrolled lust for other people's spouses and all that, call it what it is so that the physician can help you. A good and an honest heart. Hallelujah. It takes that for God to be able to work. A good and an honest heart. He says that those who are out of a good and an honest heart hear the word. And then after that, they hold fast to it. Beloved, why would we have to hold fast? Because the winds of life blow the word from us. You don't hold fast something that you cannot lose. But you hold fast something because there's a probability that you can lose it. And so many things come in life that test that word in us. That tests our obedience. That tests the things that we have heard and we want to do. But it takes a holding fast. Hallelujah. Amen. Not just holding. Most of us are just holding. Holding fast. Clutching to it. And saying that nothing is going to let this word escape me. Nothing is going to let me be sleeping with pride and arrogance. And, and then calling it other things. That, no, I'm going to hold fast to that word that God has told me. And I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit to work in me. Amen. Amen. Many times, if we did that, even our marriages would be different. But we, are, we don't have a good and an honest heart in the marriage. You say, it's you. If you hadn't done this, I wouldn't have done this. God is not talking about action and reaction. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But our marriages are based on action and reaction. You do this, I do. You do that, I repay you. If you were kind to me, I would also bless you in the bedroom. But because you are some way... But the Bible talks about unconditional love. It's not easy to give unconditional love. It's not easy to say, you have done this, but I will do this. You know, a lady was in my office for a long time, marriage counseling. When I came out, I, it was after second service. When I came out, the church service had ended. People had gone. I didn't know. So I took my bag. I said, hey, the service is on. Let's go. I said to my staff, when we got, the, uh, got to my waiting room, a lot of people. I said, are you not going for third service? Oh, it ended long ago. I was in the counseling session. I didn't even feel it. But she was saying, he does this. So I also do that. He does this. And I said, look, I can say that there's some ray of hope in your relationship. And that ray of hope is both of you want it to work. But then that action reaction is not making you go anywhere. So forget about him. And take it that you and God are partners in this marriage. And you and God are working on your side of the story. And God will work on it. Amen. Amen. But if you're always looking at, he did this and I did that, he did that, you won't go for it. A good and an honest heart. It is true that there are problems in marriage, but it's never 100% one person's fault. So that 1%, hold fast. Clutch it. And allow the Holy Ghost to change you. But don't say that when I put it on the scale, yours is 98. What is 2% in the face of 98? But when you do your 2%, God will do the 98 on his own. Without you. Hallelujah. A good and an honest heart. And you are not doing it as unto the man. I think that's why when the Bible says, wives, time. wives, submit unto your own husbands. As unto the Lord. It's a very major part. Because if it's just the husband, how many ladies know that we won't do? <laughs> what the Bible says. But when you see the as unto the Lord part. You see, God, when you come in, and the whole thing changes. When you come in, then never the lessons begin to manifest. So as I'm doing it, I am not seeing the human being. I am seeing the Lord. Hallelujah. And it's the Lord who rewards you. Amen. Now, there's everything is fast food. Fast marriage, fast this. Everything you don't like, you throw away, you kick. Then you go round, 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 ten years. Change from losing to kids to this, then you come and say, The word is true. Mm. You have let life give you hard knocks, the school of hard before you are learning. Mm. The word of God is the best teacher. Yeah. Experience is a teacher, but the best is the word of God. Amen. Those who through a good and honest heart hold fast to the word and then with much patience. Luke 8:15. With much patience, they bear fruit. Patience is one of the things you and I don't have. 
In Switzerland, when the bus is five minutes late, something is happening to them. It's true, it's good to be time conscious and all that, but life never works by a ruler. Can't you see that those plans that you made, they are already failing? Can't you see that your expectations are not like what is happening in real life? But it's with patience. The Bible says you have need of patience so that after you have done the will of God, you may inherit the promises. Between the will of God and inheriting the promises, there's a bridge called patience. It takes you from after you have done the will of God, there's a bridge and a journey and it brings you to the place of God's blessing. And many of us are not patient with God. We want everything instant. Instant tea, instant coffee, instant miracles, instant visions, and instant answers. But God has his own timing. And our timing is not God's timing. And it's patience that will make you bear the fruit of what you have heard. Don't say, though, when I heard this, I said, I'm quitting smoking today. And I just rebuked the devil. But lady pastor, it's not happening because it's a fight. The Bible says, work out your own salvation. Work it out with fear and trembling. It takes a working out. And working out takes time. So don't give up on yourself. And so I don't want this alcohol. But lady pastor, I'm just struggling. Some days are good. Some days are not good. That's how life is. That's how growing up is. Nothing happens, just boom. Ta-da, miracle. No. It's not like that. A good marriage doesn't just fall from the sky. It's hard work. Hard work. Hallelujah. You see people say, they are nicely married. Oh. They are, do you know what nonsense she has had to take? Before they are nicely married. Do you know the nonsense he has had to take? Because the nonsense is in shifts, you see. Sunday, you are on duty. The next week, somebody else is on duty. It has taken something for them to be where they are. But if everybody was to just dismiss everything, any small problem, it's okay. I'm going. I'm, it won't work. You have need of patience. So that after you have done the will of God, even the blessing of God is with patience. When you sow something, it takes time for the harvest time to come. But some of you, just before the harvest, that's when you walk out of the door. You have need of patience. So that after you have done the will of God, you may inherit the promise. May you be a good hearer from today. May the Lord give you the power to be who he wants you to be. Hallelujah. And I want to recommend to you the message, the woman of grace. Because that tip, or that message will stop you from struggles. Every day, everything is your effort. Every day, everything is what you do. No. Paul said, I prayed three times. My prayers bounced. It didn't work. I besought the Lord three times. He didn't work. So he sent an angel to buffet me, give me slaps, amazements. We're just happening in circles. He said that God's answer to my prayer was, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. You know, he said, therefore, I will glory in my infirmities. Why? So that the grace of God may rest upon me. May God give you multiplied grace Amen. to be a good hearer Amen. who out of a good and honest heart holds fast the word and brings forth fruit with patience. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand to your feet, please. I want you to pray to God. Pray about your heart. Pray about the condition of your heart. I had pride and I wanted to call it other things. You too may have other things that you know or don't know about. Ask him to search you. Search me, O oh God, David said. And know my heart, because it's not even easy for me to know my heart. Search me, Holy Spirit, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me, O oh God. Cleanse me from every sin and set me free. Oh God, I open my heart to you. I pray for your touch, for your illumination, that I may see what you want to do in my heart. I pray for the things that, Lord, we struggle with, the things that we know that, that, that they are not good that we hold on to. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will give us the strength to give up those things, to walk with you, to be committed, to want to pay the price, to want to obey, oh God. Give us even the desire for you are at work in us, both to will and to do of your good pleasure. We depend on your grace. We depend on your mercy. Oh, Jesus. 
We depend on your mercy. Work on us, Lord. All the bondages, all the things that have overcome us more than we overcoming them. We break them in Jesus' name. We break their power over their lives. And I say, let the people of God go, that they may serve him with all their hearts. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Every eye bowed, every head, every head bowed, every eye closed. Here this afternoon, you don't know Jesus. You want to say, Lady Pastor, pray for me. I want to know Jesus as my personal Savior. I don't know whether I'm going to heaven or hell when I die. Lady Pastor, today I want to be ready. I want to be sure. I want to go to heaven when I die. I want to make a fresh start with God. You are here like that this afternoon. I want you to lift your hands up. I want to pray with you. Lady Pastor, pray for me. I want to know Jesus. I want to give my life to the Lord. Come to the fountain of living life. Come to Jesus who never changes. You've been playing games with God for so long. This afternoon, God is reaching out to you wherever you are. You are standing here this afternoon. You want to say, Lady Pastor, pray for me. I want to make a commitment to Jesus. I want to give my life to the Lord. Please put up your hand. Please shoot it up high because I want to see it. And I want to reach out to you where you are. God bless you. I see your hand. God bless you. I see your hand. I believe there are many more people out there. I want you to put up your hand and come to the fountain of living water. You've put up your hand. I want you to do one more thing. I see your hands. God bless you. I want you to take another move, a step towards me. Come to the front. I want to pray with you. I want to stand with you before the throne of grace and usher you into his kingdom. Come from behind. Come from the sides. Come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. He's the only thing that satisfies. He's the only thing that when you drink of, you will not thirst again. Come to Jesus. Come to the fountain of life. Come to the fountain of salvation. Come to Jesus. Please give them a hand as they are coming. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Start to mean business with God. Come to Jesus. Please. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Spirit of God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I want you to close your eyes and to say this prayer with me. Let it be a prayer from your own heart. I'm just leading you. Let it be your personal prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, this afternoon, I come to you just as I am. I give you my life. Take it and use it as you will. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. Thank you for raising Jesus from the dead so that I might live. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that washes me from sin this morning. Satan, I break every link with you. I break every bondage over my life. For Christ has set me free. And I'm free indeed. Amen. God bless you. Hallelujah. God bless you for your decision. Open your eyes. I'm excited that you want to start all over with God. And you want to mean business. Please don't look back. But go forward. Make this place your place of worship. Be settled here. Let God minister to you. Obey the things that you are told. And I trust that your life will never be the same again. God bless. Please go with these people behind you. And come back and join us. Congratulations. Happy birthday to you. You are born again. Amen. down I want to pray with you I want to call a spade a spade and not an agricultural instrument there's something over your life that you need strength beyond yourself for God to break the power of that thing wherever you are standing I want you to shoot up your hand and I want to pray with you that the power of God will reach you wherever you are standing 
that the Spirit of God will come over you in a very profound way. That the Spirit of God will change your life and break every bondage and every stronghold. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to your throne of grace. I lift up your people before you. Father, behold every hand that is stretched out towards heaven. For our help comes from you. I pray in the name of Jesus. And I stand on the behalf of your people. I break every power of the enemy over the lives of your people. I break that subjection of Satan. I break his authority. I break his influence. I break his struggle. In the name of Jesus, I speak deliverance into the lives of your people. I speak grace for the times that are ahead. I pray for real change that comes from only you. May the spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead be quickened in you and make you an overcomer and put you over in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Please take your seats.